In reality, entrepreneurs do everything they can to minimize risk. The first thing you ought to do is define the market that you're going after. That it's not the size of the circle that matters, but knowing its boundaries. So if you don't truly think it's something that you would yourself be a customer of, don't try to pitch it. The single biggest advantage a value investor has is not IQ, it's patience and waiting. Avoid the use of spreadsheets and avoid precision thinking. And that's no fun. It's not fun to hit your head against a brick wall. So what you want is a business that has a deep moat with lots of piranha in it and that's getting deeper by the day. I'm flexible. I think it's very important in uh, investing to be a learning machine. Pay a lot of close attention to the feedback you get from the people who are listening to the pitch. He's an Indian American investor, businessman, and philanthropist. He sold his company, Trans Tech Inc., in 2000 for $20 million. Today, he is the managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds. He's Monish Pabrai, and here are his top 10 rules for success. People think that entrepreneurs take risk, uh, and they get rewarded because they take risk. In reality, entrepreneurs do everything they can to minimize risk. Uh, they are not interested in taking risk. Uh, they want free lunches, and they go after free lunches. And so if you study uh, any number of entrepreneurs, from Ray Kroc to uh, you know, Herb Schultz at Starbucks and uh, to uh, even, even Buffett and Munger and so on, what you'll find is that they have repeatedly made bets, which are low-risk bets, which have high return possibilities. So they're not going high risk, high return. They're going low risk, high return. And uh, even with Bill Gates, for example, uh, the total amount of capital that ever went into Microsoft was less than 50,000 uh, between the time it started and today. That's the total amount of capital that went into the company. So Microsoft, you cannot say was a high risk venture because there was no capital deployed. Uh, but it had high uncertainty. Bill Gates could have gone bankrupt or Bill Gates could have ended up the wealthiest person on the Forbes 400. And he ended up at the extreme end of the bell curve, and that's fine. But he did not take risk to get there. He was comfortable with uncertainty. So entrepreneurs are great at dealing with uncertainty and also very good at minimizing risk. That's the classic great entrepreneur. If you look at any market, any product, any market, there will typically be three or four players at the most that control 80% of that market. And it could be making airplanes, or it could be making you know, hair clips. Um, you can pretty much go across the board. It could be making software, anything you want. And, um, and you know, I found that stunning. You know? and, and if you invert that, so one of my heroes, Charlie Munger, says, you know, every time you encounter something, always invert the, the logic to try to get some other place. So if you invert that principle, first of all, if you agree with the principle, then, you know, then the inversion would be that if you're starting a business and you say that this is a $10 billion market and um, I just need 10% of it and I'll be a billion dollar company, well, right there, you're off. Because the inversion would be that if you're going after a market, you're your approach has to be, how do I get 60% of that market? And so if your starting point is that I'm going to take 2% of this market or 5% of this market, what you have not done is you have not segmented that market properly. And that is a fatal flaw. So the first thing you ought to do is define the market that you're going after. And after you've defined it, if you don't get to very clear-cut game plan to get 50, 60% market share, then don't even try. Because either you have not done your job correctly or you don't have anything to offer that is going to be that compelling to people. I think another, another very important trait for successful investing is to stay within your circle of competence. Um, so I think Buffett always says that it's not the size of the circle that matters, but knowing its boundaries, it's absolutely critical. And, um, uh, you know, Charlie Munger talks about that 
he gives a couple of examples. One is he says that uh, if in a small town uh, you bought the McDonald's franchise, you bought the Ford dealership, Ford dealership, gas station, not so good. And <laughs> gas station we leave for the Patels, low cost operations. Okay, and then, uh, then you want the best uh, class A office building and you want the best residential building, right? So if you've got these four assets and you don't need to own them completely, you could own 20% of each of them, right? So his perspective was that if in Peoria, Illinois, you own these four assets uh, and you just sat on them for your whole life, you would end up probably quite wealthy. And uh, so if you think about it from a you know, modern portfolio theory point of view, you would say, well, you're not diversified, everything's in one geography, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but the odds are it probably still work out. And in fact, he has a friend uh, here in, uh, near Stanford, uh, John Ariega, who all he did was bought real estate within a mile of the Stanford campus. And you know, I think Ariega is a billionaire. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, what is Ariega's circle of competence? You know, it's this small. So the size of the circle is not relevant. Uh, staying inside the circle is very fundamental. Do not try to sell something that you wouldn't buy yourself, okay? So if you don't truly think it's something that you would yourself be a customer of, don't try to pitch it, you know? Don't be a used car salesman. So please make sure that whatever you're trying to come up with is compelling enough that you would yourself deeply be deeply interested in buying that product. So, you know, Charlie Munger likes to say that you don't make money when you buy stocks and you don't make money when you sell stocks. You make money by waiting. And uh, so the biggest, uh, the single biggest advantage a value investor has is not IQ, it's patience, and waiting, waiting for the right pitch, and waiting for many years for the right pitch. So what's that saying of Pascal that uh, you like about uh, just sitting in the Yeah, room? all man's misery stem from his inability to sit in a room alone and do nothing. And all I'd like to do to adapt Pascal is all investment managers' miseries stem from their inability to sit alone in a room and do nothing. The way, the way to really look at investing is that um, when, when you look at, again, a business like uh, Google or Microsoft or Berkshire, you really have to put yourself in the shoes of the people running the business. And you have to ask yourself, how do they run the business? Do they run it through a set of spreadsheets? Or how do they run it? And I, and I would bet that uh, most of these businesses are run in a manner where the founders or CEOs are really looking at kind of three to five variables that dominate most of the, their thinking and outcome and direction. And so as an investor, uh, you've got to hone in on those same variables. So if you can get to the same variables, if you're gonna invest in Microsoft, you can get to the same variables that Satya Nadella is using, and if you, and Google, you get to the same variables that Larry and Sergey are using, then you're getting very close to uh, trying to figure out what the business might do. And, and from there you can extrapolate whether it's underpriced or fairly priced and so on. So that's what I would suggest is avoid the use of spreadsheets and avoid precision thinking. The stronger the marketing, um, the weaker the sales engine can be. Okay, so I do not consider myself a good salesman. I consider myself a poor salesman. Uh, I consider myself a pretty strong marketing person. And so if you have done your marketing homework, you can be a leper and make sales. And a standing example of that is someone in front of you. Uh, because basically um, my, my approach to sales would be you know 180 degrees opposed to your uh, traditional used car salesman uh, schmoozing model and golf courses and all that. You know, none of that is of much interest to me. Uh, so the stronger the marketing, uh, the less uh, important the sales engine becomes. So it is very important, in my opinion, to spend incredible amounts of time on the marketing aspect of the business. Because if you don't spend that time on that aspect of it, you will spend 50x that time on the sales end and hit your head against a brick wall. 
and that's no fun. It's not fun to hit your head against a brick wall. So it's it's good not to go there. So so I just feel the stronger the marketing, uh, the weaker the sales. Now, uh, quickly define moats uh, in terms of uh, a, a business that uh, keeps competition away. Well, you know, um, if you talk to Michael Porter, uh, he would give you five books on what is meant by, uh, you know, strategy and competitive advantage and durable competitive advantage. And if you talk to Warren and Charlie, they would just say it's a moat and they'd break it down to one, one word. But basically, it's the ability of a business uh, to have some type, of an, some type of an enduring competitive advantage that allows it to earn a better than average rate of return over an extended period of time. Uh, and uh, so some businesses have narrow moats, some have broad moats, some have moats that are deep but get filled up pretty quickly. Uh, so what you want is a business that has a deep moat with lots of piranha in it, and that's getting deeper by the day. Uh, that's, that's a great business. I'm flexible. I think it's very important in uh, investing to be a learning machine and to have flexibility and uh, to be willing to uh, look at the, the opportunity set and decide whether you need to do anything at all or what is the best thing you can do based on the available opportunities. Let's say you have come up with a compelling value proposition. Let's say you're absolutely truthful, you truly understand it, and your pitch is truthful and all of that. Um, what I have found is that, um, is that basically uh, whatever you come up with, and you know, you've come up with it in your lab and thinking about it, talk to friends, looks great. It's the service or product looks great. The real litmus test of that is when you put it in front of customers, right? So when you go out and make your pitch or create an ad or whatever else, and a very, very important thing for an entrepreneur to do is when they put that out there, be very, very, pay a lot of close attention to the feedback you get from the people who are listening to the pitch. And this is very important at the front end because what is probably the case is that whatever you came up with is off base. It's not exactly what your market wants. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a friend of mine in Chicago, and he started this company called Install Shield. And uh, many of you might be familiar with the company when you're installing different Windows products, Install Shield comes up. And uh, Viresh basically uh, was like, I think, 19 years old or something when he came up with Install Shield. Um, and he, he said, you know, he went to a trade show. He was going to go to a trade show, some software tools trade show. And he was trying to do a whole bunch of different things. He was trying to do Google Maps 30, 30 years ago, you know, when there was no way that the computing could, uh, could support that sort of thing. Um, but he went to a trade show, and he had created this kind of, you know, trade show booth with the different products. And he had, he had seven products, seven different tools that he was pitching. And it wasn't balancing on that uh, booth because he wanted to put four bullets on one side and four bullets on the other. And he was like four and three. So he was like, it was really bothering him. And so as an afterthought, this little tool he had which was to install software for installing software was his eighth bullet. He just put that in, in the end. At the bottom, the eighth bullet was install software installation tool. And... Um, Throughout the whole week was goes by, I think a couple of days he was at this trade show booth and all these people are coming by and all this stuff going on. And there was a guy across the um, aisle from him who spent two days looking at those eight things because he, <laughs> he was in the software business. And after two days he came up to him and said, you know that product, I have an interest in that product. And this product did not exist, it was in Viresh's <laughs> mind. And so this was one of the only leads he picked up at the show, so he went back and created the product and gave it to the guy, and then he found that other people wanted it, and so on and so forth. Okay, so bottom line is that if you study, if you study startups, uh, you will find over and over that what actually works is not what you actually came up with. What actually works is like you know some tangent or some kind of 
you ex- you mention something to a customer in passing, and then they grab onto that and say, hey, you know, I want that. And you say, oh, he's unusual. He wants an unusual thing. I'll still keep my core pitch. No. What you really have to do is pay really close attention to what is going on. Thank you so much for watching. I made this video because Caesar V asked me to. So if there's a famous entrepreneur that you want me to profile next, leave it in the comments below and I'll see what I can do. I'd also love to know which of the top 10 rules had the biggest impact on you and why. Leave it in the comments. I'll join in the discussion. Thank you so much for watching. Continue to believe and I'll see you soon.